COVID-19, DNA testing, or infectious disease clinical testing? Welcome to P23 Labs, a high-complexity molecular diagnostics lab that uses the latest technology to offer a full suite of molecular diagnostic tests, clinical tests, and wellness consultations. We give you access to knowledge and healthcare resources that will transform your health. Schedule an appointment and order your custom test today with our healthcare team www.p23labs.com Are you tired of being overcharged and forced into paying a monthly subscription for your Mac and Windows software? Well, if you are, currently we're having a 50% off discount on all the latest Mac and Windows software, such as AutoCAD, SolidWorks, Photoshop, Microsoft Office, and much more. Our 50% off discount will be ending soon, so be sure to text us, Need Software, to 213-640-9738. That's 213-640-9738. We aim to please, so expect 24-7 technical support, the latest premium software, instant software links delivered to your email, and PayPal Buyer's Protection Guarantee. Welcome to a brand new episode of Tariq Radio. I am your gracious host. My name is Mr. Tariq Nasheed. Glad to have everybody tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to chop up some good game on today's broadcast, as we always do. Not going to be too, too long, but we're going to be very, very effective. Everybody hit that like button, hit that thumbs up button, ladies and gentlemen, and share this link because sometimes... YouTube puts us under a shadow ban, but that's okay. We're still going to chop up that game. And what we're going to do right now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take that real quick commercial break. So y'all don't move a muscle while everybody's piling on in the room. Y'all let everybody know that Tariq Radio is live and we will be right back after these messages. Yo, it's your boy, Mr. Locario, the bad boy of the dating game. And if you really want to learn how to attract beautiful women, go to badboymembership.com. The bad boy membership gives you step-by-step, easy to follow, dating advice tutorials every month. You'll also get my documentary, Game Kings, the definition of game for free by joining the bad boy membership. Step up your game today and go to badboymembership.com. That's badboymembership.com. Listen up, squares. You need to get the legendary book on game, The Art of Mackin', by author Tariq King Flex Nasheed. Available on Amazon right now. Can you dig it? This book has been a bestseller for 20 years, Jack. And the New York Times called it a classic. That means it's out of sight. So this book ain't for no lames who ain't trying to learn the game. Jive turkeys. So if you're ready to stop slacking in your macking, get the Art of Macking book on Amazon and Barnes and Noble right now. Sucker. Rated PG. That stands for plenty of game. Jive chumps. If you are in need of credit repair services and you're looking for a company that is professional, knowledgeable, and can get you results, contact Mastermind Credit Restoration. You can contact them by phone at 832-626-3900 or schedule a consultation online at themastermindcreditrestoration.com. Be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram at Mastermind Credit Restoration LLC. 
Are you ready for a guaranteed solution to end white supremacy? Tired of worrying about your safety, finances, and well-being? That's because you need spiritual protection in order to put these deficient white supremacists in their place. Imagine having the upper hand. At StarKnowledge.net, I teach black people how to connect to the hidden name of God in the Bible, the Elohim, that will help you speak your desires into manifestation. And together we can cast out the end white supremacy. And only at StarKnowledge.net, that's StarKnowledge.net, that's StarKnowledge.net. Are you looking to start your own business? Millions of brothers have turned to eBay to escape the rat race. Become your own boss and get the Power Seller Research eBook. It's a comprehensive, step-by-step -step guide that explains how to start an eBay business. The website is PowerSellerResearch.com. Again, that's PowerSellerResearch.com. Ladies, is your stomach sticking out more than your butt? Fellas, is your chest looking like you can fit a C-cup sports bra? Walking around here looking like Megan the Stallion about your body? If you answered yes to any of these questions, check out Solomon'sFitnessWorld.com. Solomon will help you transform your body ASAP. Trainer Solomon Pratt, he is the best. He offers customized online personal training from his app, and he sells the best ankle power and booty-resistant bands in the industry. Solomon Fitness World bands work well for men, women, and it will tone your body anywhere. So go to Solomon'sFitnessWorld.com right now. Enter the discount code Tariq and save 10% on your order. Solomon'sFitnessWorld.com. You know that unforgivable heat you feel when you're in a hot city on a hot day, and by the time you walk from your ride to your destination, sweat is dripping off your face? You're fried. Well, your cell phones go through the same thing. They overheat, and sometimes they go off and never come on again. Here's the solution. You stop the phone fry, the new affordable protective phone carrying case that'll keep your cell phone from frying, no batteries required, fits all cell sizes and unisex. Available now at FriendlyRides.Club. Like I'm your friend and rise to the club. FriendlyRides.Club, all black owned. Yo, listen up, family. It's going to be a pull-up summer, so you want to stand strong with the blackest t-shirt out this summer. The Black as F limited edition t-shirt was created by designer Thad Baltimore, and it's available right now at webuyblack.com or at tbaltimore.com. The shirt is black as F, and you need to get your black as F t-shirt right now. The esteemed Dr. Francis Square Swelson taught us that to destroy white supremacy, we must understand what it is and engage in the appropriate counter-racist behaviors. The most impactful counter-racist behavior that any black person can engage in is in the discovery and fulfillment of their unique purpose through daily effective action. However, most of us will never reach our potential because of life's natural constraints and the imposed boundaries of systematic white supremacy. How can we overcome this? Head over to KineticLiving.com and discover the 10-minute strategy our ancient history provides that we can employ every night to strategically increase our daily performance, productivity, and goal achievement by 25%. That's K-E-N-E-T-I-C-L-I-B-I-N-G.com. Bro, stop playing and start spraying. Leave a op on the ground where you stand. At all costs, yeah, make sure you protect it. Old goon juice, the formula been tested. You can defend yourself if you find that you need a little help. Gotta stay ready, ain't no love in the street. Pepper spray straight to the face, make them get weak. Get it at ogoonjuice.com. If they think it, you slipping, then tell them to come get them some. If you packing this, you won't be lacking. A shot to the eye in them problems you have it. Maximum strip, hit them haters on ground. So you can feel free when you out in the town. Ogoon juice and don't forget a shirt, man. You gotta stay ready, that evil on lurk. Yeah. You are now tuning into the legendary Tariq Nasheed. I ain't gave a little blood on that bridge and sell my On Tariq Radio. I say whoever threw that paper, your mom's a hoe. Oh, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. We're back. We're back. We're back. We're back. Welcome back to Tariq Radio, ladies and gentlemen. Glad to have everybody tuning in. I need everybody to hit that thumbs up button. Hit that thumbs up button. And everybody share this link on your social media. You know how they do. They get real janky style with the little shadow bands that they have going on. But we're still pushing on. We're still going to do our thing. We're still chopping up good game as we always do. Shout out to everybody who's still contributing to the Hidden History Museum 
crowdfunding that's going on on Indiegogo right now. Family, we have six days left and we're basically at the halfway mark right now, ladies and gentlemen. We're almost at the halfway mark. We have raised within the last three and a half weeks $430,000. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let's be clear, that is a very monumental feat within itself to raise that type of money in such a short period of time. That's an amazing feat. That's amazing. That is nothing to sneeze at. I have to take off my hat and applaud everybody for going this far with the crowdfunding. But we have to remember, this is just the halfway mark. We have to get to one million. And we gotta do it in six days or everyone is going to have their money refunded. And I set it up that way for a very specific reason. I wanted us to get into the habit of getting stuff done without procrastinating. A lot of times in black society, we have a habit of just dragging stuff on for a long time. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to get into this whole thing where we're just dragging and dragging and just dragging things out for years like church building funds. I, I, I didn't want to get into that type of vibe because the other people, when it comes to getting stuff done, they get stuff done. They get it knocked out real quickly. No questions asked. When it's something that's going to empower their community, they get stuff knocked out very, very quickly. Through osmosis, they know how to get it popping. When it comes to us doing something empowering, see, we know how to get stuff popping when it's some bullshit. Let's keep it above. In our society, when it's something that really ain't that constructive for us, we put all our energy into it. We'll get stuff done. We'll, we'll give it top dollar and top priority. If it's something about partying, smoking, drinking, turning up, swagging out. If we're going to, when it's time to line up and buy them Nikes, boy, we're the first in line. We're there camping out before the store opens. You see, I had a couple of people saying, how come we don't extend the deadline for the the crowdfunding, we're not going to do that. Number one, I can't do that. And number one, I don't want to do that because nobody extends the release dates for the Nikes when they come out. When the Nikes come out, people are ready for that. We're ready for everything else except empowerment. See, let's get off that fear thing. No, when it's time to go down to spring break, oh, we got the rental cars, the bundles, the swaggy gear, we spend top dollar on that just to turn up and floss for everybody. But when it comes time to some, to do some real empowerment, all of a sudden, people want to drag their feet. That's a habit we have to get out of. That's one of the reasons why we had the crowdfunding for 30 days. And let's be very clear, we did very great for 30 days. Where we are right now, we're not at the 30 days yet. We did very great and we're doing very great. And let's be very clear. We can still take this thing to the finish line. We're not out the game yet. We got six days. We can still take this thing to the finish line. We just got to get enough people on code. This is a psychological thing. This is not really about money. I want everybody to be clear. This isn't about money. This is about the right psychology, the right psychological mindset. We have the money as black people. The problem is we have a psychological roadblock that's been put into us by the white supremacists where we prioritize giving other people our money so that we can empower them and we're taking second fiddle. We have to get out of that. We have to get out of that. You understand? And I have some people in the chat room saying that they're not going to allow us to build anything. Look at Black Wall Street. Now, that's a thing that's in people's minds as well. A lot of black folks are fearful of making a power move. Let's be very clear. A lot of black people are very fearful of making a power move like this because it's scary. 
I've heard that a lot. Man, these white folks, they gonna get mad if we build a museum. They trying to gentrify everything. They gonna get mad at us. We, 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 we don't know about that now. Let me tell you something. Bucking your eyes being scared is not going to save you from the wrath of the white supremacists. See, look at what they do to us when we do nothing. If you do nothing, act scared and, and buck dance and turn up, you're going to be the first target they go after. Notice the people that they ambush the most. They ambush the people who are asleep and not woke. Those are the first people. They know, Notice how a lot of times they ambush a lot of the coons, if we're going to be real. A lot of the Negroes who are on the Kumbaya, All Lives Matter, those are the first ones to get ambushed. Look at our brother Botham John. I, I, I'm not trying to disparage the deceased, but Botham John, when you look at this brother, look at his life, he didn't really hang around black folks. Botham John was around white people all the time, and look what happened to him. He got killed by a white supremacist sitting in his home. There was another brother down there in Texas who was all on social media. I forgot the brother's name talking about all lives matter. If black folks just comply, black folks be bringing it on themselves. He was buck dancing it up. He's all on social media talking about where the white women at. And there was an altercation one time and then a cop showed up and he went to shake the cop's hand and the cop shot him dead. Family, the only road to success is empowerment. We better get off that fear. Doing nothing makes us bigger targets. You understand? See, we're talking about success on today's broadcast. See, we as black people, particularly foundational black Americans, Family, we got to get off this thing where we're not, we're taught and we think that we're not supposed to be successful at anything. We're taught and we're programmed that we're supposed to be in the back of the bus. We're supposed to take second fiddle to everybody else. We're supposed to just kind of sit back and if the Lord allows it, some success might come our way sooner or later. Someday, someday soon. We got that someday soon bullshit mentality. Let me tell you something, family. Success is not based on luck. Success is not based on chance. Success is built. We have to build success. That's the only real, true success. The success that you build. You understand? We have to build the success that we want to have. We sit around here waiting on a lucky break. See, we hear stuff like that. A lucky break, a chance encounter. We're sitting around waiting on some success to just kind of come our way. We have to create it, family. This is something that we have to create from the grassroots. We have to create success brick by brick. Success can be predicted. You can predict when something is going to be successful. Family, I've been in the game for a minute. Almost every single thing that I've touched in the last 20 years has been successful because I plan on the success. You understand? We have a lot of people out here who see us doing successful things. And when I mean successful, doing them things successful and independent of the dominant society. See, that's the thing. See, we think in order for us to be successful, we got to find good white folks. That's what Oprah said she was taught as a child. Oprah said she was taught to find good white folks. And let me tell you something. White people are not going to give you success. I want black folks to understand where I'm coming from with that. Black people, white folks are not going to give you success. Somebody in the chat room is saying, Tariq, give us another 17 days. No, we have six days to raise over half a million dollars. And ladies and gentlemen, we can do it. We can do that. 
We can do that in six days. We absolutely can do that in six days. Family, we're powerful people. We can do that. That's not a hell of a lot of money. We can do that. Everybody go to Indiegogo right now. Let's put some on it. We got, a, we got a couple of thousand people in the room right now. We got a couple of thousand people in the room right now, ladies and gentlemen. We almost got three. We just started broadcasting right now. Family, listen. We got 3,000 people almost in the room right now. 3,000 people. It's going to be more. More people are coming on in. But family, 3,000 people gave $200 right this very minute. We have it. We're, we're, we'll be right there. We could have that money for the museum within 10 minutes. We could have it in 10 minutes. 3,000 people in here put $200 down right this very minute. We got it. It's that simple. This is not rocket science. Success is a mindset. It's something that you build. But again, we're taught in order for us to do constructive things, we have to have white people come in and give us success and elevate us to a success level. That's not what it is. White people are never going to give you success. I want black people to understand that. What white people will do, they will give you a platform. They can give you that. But the success comes from how you capitalize off the platform they give you. Because, see, understand this. You think that you're going to be successful when a white person gets involved. But the thing is, when white people get involved, they're basically going to exploit your talent for their own success. Now, they might give you some of the crumbs that they're going to make from your success. But trust and believe, if a white person gets involved with your so-called success, they're going to profit more off your success than you and then flick you a couple of crumbs. And then on top of that, you're not going to even own your property. Because white people do not share ownership with your ass. Let's be very clear. They do not share ownership with you. And that's where the real success is. Success is in ownership. You understand? Success comes from owning your talent and your intellectual property and everything else. It comes from owning. This is why they're so threatened. When black folks start talking about ownership, then we see a lot of funny style things happen, but that's okay. This is why we have to start protecting ourselves. Let's look at the music industry. When black people back in the 60s, remember back in the 50s and 60s, black people were getting screwed. It was black people who was creating all of these music genres and all of these white executives were coming in, capitalizing off of it, owning the masters and flicking the black people crumbs, buying them Cadillacs and stuff like that. And then a handful of black folks in the 1960s said, hell no, let me start owning my property. People like Sam Cooke, when Sam Cooke started talking about ownership, People like Sammy Davis Jr. started warning Sam Cooke, hey, man, the mafia and all these other people, man, man, they kind of looking at you real strange, man. You better watch your back because remember, a lot of the music industry at the time was controlled by the mafia. They were involved in a lot of that stuff. So a lot of people believe they took Sam Cooke out. See, we have to also understand the importance of protecting ourselves. See, our brother James Brown, he knew how to protect himself. James Brown would blow your damn brains out and folks knew it. So James Brown was about ownership. He owned everything. That's why he was so successful independently for a long time. And James Brown would carry his guns all over the place. James Brown was known for drawing down on niggas. You understand? But James Brown owned his recording studio. He owned radio stations. James Brown owned the record label. He even owned the pressing plants. He understood the importance of ownership. You understand? And how to protect himself. Protecting yourself is a very important element of that. But people in the dominant society, they're going to exploit, exploit your talent for their own success. 
This is why success is built from you. You have to build success. It was a sister who tweeted something earlier today and I retweeted it. It was a great tweet. Let me look that tweet up. This sister put out a phenomenal tweet and I want to read her tweet verbatim. She hit on something very heavy about when you're dealing with the dominant society and they want to have little meetings with you. Let me find that tweet of that sister. I'm looking now. Hold on one second. What did that sister say? What did she say? Where did she say? Where is it? Hey, when I can't find a tweet. Oh, here it is. Our sister Hannah Drake. She said, when it's black people, it's let's meet for coffee so I can pick your brain. But when it's white people dealing with other white people, it's like, what's your consulting fee? And she was saying, black people, stop meeting over coffee and giving away your greatness for an ice mocha latte. Man, that boy, that sister hit it right on the money. Boy, white people, when it comes to us, boy, they they like to get with you and have these little little meetings where they want to pick your brain. Black folks, you better watch out for that. And see, what happens is we go to these little meetings with white folks and we start giving up all our ideas, thinking, okay, they about to throw some money at us. And we done set up and gave them all of our ideas. And all of a sudden they're using them and they ain't even giving us crumbs. They're using our ideas and just tossing us to the curb and acting like we never existed. But with white folks, white folks know better. When they call another white person for a meeting, white people set up consulting businesses. They're like, okay, yeah, I meet with you and my consulting fee is $60 an hour. You understand? That's how they do. They set up consulting businesses. So if you talk to me, you're going to pay me to talk to me. Yeah, just like that TV show Snowfall, what, what they did to our brother Freeway Rick. They stole Freeway Rick's story. They didn't give Freeway Rick a dime for Snowfall. That's Freeway Rick's story. And family, I had to learn this stuff later on. I mean, early on. This is why, as you see, I'm so hell-bent on ownership. You see, I learned early on You can't be going to these meetings giving these people your ideas. I made those mistakes, and I'm telling you from experience. And I had to learn. See, this is why so many many of my projects have become successful, because I understand the power of my brand, and I understand the power of owning my brand. When I first started writing books, and my books became very successful on the streets, these white corporations wanted to do meetings, wanted to have meetings. Then I started getting these major book deals. Now I was smart enough to really negotiate my book deals very thoroughly. I didn't do three book deals and all that with all of these major publishers. I would do a one book deal with one and then go to another one, do a one book deal with them. My book, Player Be Played, is with Simon & Schuster. My book, The Mac Within, is with Penguin. But after a while, I even learned, let me stop going to these majors, because what they do, they give me a big advance, but they still make the bulk of the money, and I get a very small percentage, and I have to pay the damn advance back. So they give me a couple of hundred thousand dollars up front, but the thing is, I get like 8% of the book sales. And then I still have to pay back the damn advance they gave me. So the books that I own outright, I still make a lot of money on the books that I own outright. Fortunately, my first big seller, The Art of Mac, and I own that outright now. I own it all outright. And I was going to, I was about to give it to a publisher, but there was some stuff going on with the negotiations that fell through and I ended up not giving it to him, which was a great thing. But my book, The Art of Mac, and I own the rights to that, and I make more money every month on that book than I do on my other books in a year. Well, well, the two books, that's with the major publishers. I got two books with major publishers, okay? So I make more money off the independent books a month. I get thousands of dollars a month off my independent books, the books that are owned by me, then I do the the I get a couple of hundred dollars every six months from the major label from the major publishers. You think? Ownership is very important. And 
what I would do when I started going to these meetings with BH1 and MTV and all of these people, when my books got hot, my books started to cross over. So a lot of these major networks wanted to put me on these shows. And I did a lot of shows for MTV, VH1, BET. I did a lot of stuff for NBC. I was doing stuff on, you know, Conan. Some of y'all can pull up clips. A lot of folks, my new listeners, a lot of y'all don't know. I was on Conan a few times. I was on The Tonight Show. I was on a lot of major networks promoting my books. At one point, NBC was trying to give me a television show. They were trying to give me a late night show like Carson Daly because they said I had a, a very high Q rating, meaning when you put a certain person on television, they have a personality that makes people want to tune in. Some people have very likable personalities. They call that a Q rating, and they found out when I'm on television, whenever I'm on certain shows, the ratings go up. I have a very high Q rating, so they were like, hey, we can give you a show. They were trying to give me a late night show on NBC after Conan. This is why they were having me on all these shows. They were also trying to give me a daytime television show. I was meeting up with the people who were producing the, the Judge Joe Brown show. We were meeting with some heavyweights about doing some, some real mainstream stuff. And I was working, we were working on that for a minute. And then I started to realize they were putting these little deals in place where if you do a show with these people, they own your ass forever. Do y'all, I want y'all to understand what they started to do in television, especially reality shows and daytime television shows, they started to put what was called Bethany Frankel clauses in the contracts. There was a white woman named Bethany Frankel. She was on one of these housewives shows. Some of y'all know who she is. I want to say she was on, it was on one of those shows, Bethany Frankel. Y'all Google her name. She was on one of the housewives shows, on, on one of these reality shows. And Bethany Frankel, once she got on these shows, she started building her brand up. She used these shows in order to get all types of endorsements. So she got all types of wine and all. So Bethany Frankel started making hundreds of millions of dollars. So the networks realized, hey, this is another stream of income we could be making here. Was it Housewives of New York? Yeah, okay. So they realized, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, Skinny Girl Vodka. So they were like, wait a minute. We can be making another stream of income with these people making hundreds of millions of dollars with these endorsements. So now they started putting these things in the contracts. If you do a television show with us, if we sign you to our network, we're going to get a percentage of every single thing you do for the rest of your life. I'm literally, this is what's in the contract. They were putting this stuff in the contract. So even if you do one season on a television show and then you go on to do other stuff, they are going to get a percentage of that. It's like the 360 deals that they were doing with record labels, but they were doing that with television on steroids. I was like, hell to the damn no. I'm not giving them all of my intellectual property. They were going to try to get all the rights to my books and everything. If they put me on these shows, they were like, if we give you a television show because they saw how my books were selling, they were like, we're going to get 20% of your book sales in perpetuity. I kept seeing the word perpetuity pop up. I'm like, whoa. I'm like, wait, my book was already selling before I met you. Dude, th these contracts now are insane. So I was backing up off that stuff. I'm like, well, I can do my own thing because as you know, my Q rating is high. So I can go out here and get my own audience, which is exactly what I did. I would build my own audience from the grassroots. I already had the, the streets on lock. People were already buying my books. So I kept putting out my books. I put out the Elite Way. That was a bestseller. I put that out independently. And then... 
I started doing the films. And let's go back before the films. Let's go back. I'm giving y'all some game here. We were going to do some stuff revolve, revolving around my my Mac, my my Art of Mac and books and my Mac Within books because I was doing stuff with MTV and the ratings were through the roof. I did a few episodes of MTV Made and the ratings were through the roof. It was like one of the, the highest rated episodes of Made I was on. People loved it and my books were just selling through the roof and I was using MTV and VH1. They were like infomercials to me because they would show my episode of made all the time it was it was a big ass infomercial i mean they would just show almost marathons of it and then they gave me a spring break special some of y'all might remember so i did a spring break special some people said they didn't know about my work until hidden colors dude hidden colors came much later i was doing a lot of mainstream stuff before hidden colors because relationships and I was doing the relationship thing, that never goes out of style. I can get back into the relationship movement and, and start writing relationship books again and go right back mainstream if I wanted to right now. Mainstream, the mainstream community loves relationship books because relationship books and relationship gurus, people who talk about dating and relationships, that never goes out of style. Never, that's why our good brother, Kevin Samuels is doing great right now because there was a void with that relationship information because I stopped doing a lot of relationship advice and I focus more on, you know, social justice and black empowerment. So there was kind of a void there. Now, brother Kevin Samuels, he's doing great in that lane. That's why I applaud that brother. And I wish more people stop hating on that brother. I, I, I love everybody. If you're a black person and you got a certain level of success, I love that. But the thing is, with the relationship stuff, we were going to do stuff around the Mac within book and the art of Mac and book, but I wasn't going to sign them janky deals. So I put out my own DVD. The DVD we did in 2005. We filmed a DVD. It was kind of a humorous, tongue in cheek type of thing. And the DVD was called Mac Lessons. Again, yes, a lot of folks remember I was on Charm School, VH1. Oh, uh, VH1, not only was I on Charm School, around the same time, VH1 gave me a gang of money to do a pilot for my own show on VH1. You can see the pilot online. It was the Gold Digger Show. And uh, they gave me a grip for that. And we negotiated with them as far as my book because I was writing a book called The Art of Gold Digging and they were going to buy the rights to the book but one of the one part of the deal was if the show didn't get picked up by the network all the rights of the book resorts back to me so they gave me a gang of money just for the pilot they didn't pick it up and I still got the rights to the book back so we were negotiating some pretty good deals here but at the time, I said, you know what, let me, I already have a built-in audience. Let me put out my own DVD, dropping game about my book. So we did something called the Mac Lessons DVD. And in order to promote the Mac Lessons DVD, this was back in 2005, 2006, I started doing the Mac Lessons podcast. You didn't? I just, I, I wanted to do the Mac Lessons podcast. And that was supposed to be temporary. Just to promote the, the DVD. But the, the Mac Lessons podcast took off. That became a phenomenon. Because that was one of the early podcasts. A lot of people weren't doing podcasts at the time. So that took off. But let me go back to what I was saying earlier about going to these networks and going to these meetings, giving the ideas away. I would go to some of these folks and start giving my ideas away. They were like, hey, man, we heard you. We saw that you you sell a lot of books. You do a lot of great things on VH1 and your ratings are very high. What ideas do you have for a television show? And I go in there and I tell them my ideas 
then all of a sudden, what I just told them goes into production, and then they've cast some other white dudes into what I just told them. And I would see this over and over again. I would go to these meetings, I would go to these movie studios, and they would ask me about my life, and I'd be like, yeah, you know, I write these books, and I did this, and I would teach guys, you know, how to have some game and we had a little underground movement going on out here in LA back in the late 90s where I would get dudes and kind of they would pay me to teach them some game and I would just tell them my life and they were like yeah we need to do something we need to do something and then all of a sudden a few years after I would talk to these people the same folks I talked to would produce stuff like the movie Hitch I'm like whoa that's Whoa, that sounded very, this looks and sounds very similar to what I just told your ass that I was doing a couple of years earlier. Then I would go, again, y'all can go look at all of this stuff that I was doing for VH1. I was doing a gang of stuff for VH1. And I was in these meetings with them after I would do a lot of these shows with them. I would do, I would do these guest appearances and then they would pick my brain for ideas for me. And then all of a sudden, shows like the pickup artist would pop up with these white boys. And then another show, like Tough Love with another white boy. I'm like, whoa. Then I stopped going to these meetings and telling them my ideas. I would just go to these meetings and hey, I'm like, listen, I'm listening to you now. I'm not gonna keep going to these meetings telling these folks my damn ideas. So they can run with it and then put a white person who don't nobody know. You dig? They would do that all the time. I said, wait a minute. I'm going to have to take control of my property, my intellectual property and my books because these folks are getting my ideas and running with them and not giving me anything. So let me shut the hell up. I already have an audience. Let me deal with my audience. Let me deal with my audience. You understand? And it has paid off over the 20 years. So when people see some of the stuff that I do and see how successful it is, understand that it was built brick by brick. Success is built. I knew that the stuff that I was going to put out was going to be successful. I understood the importance of building brick by brick, see? So when you have a lot of these non-FBA tethers who look at foundational black American success and try to project their own scams of failures to it, see, that's a that's a loser mentality. When you see another black person successful, you're supposed to soak up the game that that person used to become successful. The biggest cop out is to project your own nefarious mindset onto a, a successful black person. And that's a very bad habit that a lot of folks have. A lot of folks will see a successful black person and say, okay, if that black person was successful, they must have done something nefarious in order to get success. You see it at your job. If you see a black person getting a promotion, you think, oh, that person must have went in there sucking some dick in order to get a promotion. You, 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 all, you automatically project what you would do. You know you'd be in there sucking that damn dick. And you project it onto that other person. You don't know that other person's journey. Get off that type of mentality, especially some of y'all non-FBA people. Y'all good for doing that, projecting that onto Foundation of Black Americans. Y'all good for that. Instead of soaking up the game, learning what that person did, you bro, that got you gotta be some kind of scam. No, it ain't no scam. Some people just work hard. Let me tell you something about me. You're not gonna out hustle me. You're not going to out hustle me. You're not going to out grind me. See, if you see me doing something successful or you see me enjoying something that I've done successful, because that's the thing that chaps the asses of a lot of people who ain't grinding because you think there's a shortcut somewhere. No, you have to build success. There is no shortcut. And you're supposed to be successful, black people. You are destined for success. Get off this thing where your lot in life is to be struggling and being behind everybody. No, you're supposed to be successful. And success is predicted and success is built. 
And I want some of y'all non-FBA FBA folks, y'all better get off the bullshit. It's y'all, y'all be the main ones sitting around talking about somebody's hustling and scamming. Well, Tariq be on vacation and shit. Why, why Tariq be all on vacation? You be using, getting people money. I get my money because I am the money. Money is people. Be very clear. I'm the money. Money is time and energy. I'm the money. I'm the time and I'm the energy. Understand that. We are the money. Money is people. Money is time and energy. You'll see me on vacation. You know why? Because when dusty niggas and slackers are somewhere smoking and drinking and chasing hood rats, I'm bunkering down. I'm locking down writing. You understand? When I was in my 20s, when all my friends were drinking and smoking and clubbing and partying, and I like clubbing and partying too, but I knew, hey, if I want to be successful, I might have to cut the partying and clubbing out at least for a few months. The club and the partying ain't going nowhere. So what did I do in my 20s? I locked myself in my apartment and I wrote one of the best-selling books on relationships and game ever, which was The Art of Mac. And I wrote that book in six months. I locked myself in the crib. No clubbing, no partying, just writing. Well, everybody's trying to get me out the house. No, I got a, I got a masterpiece I'm working on. I'm grinding, writing, and I'm talking about writing, writing. I wrote it longhand and then had somebody else type it up for me. Because at the time, this was in 1999. So I didn't really have computers like that. I didn't really know how to work Microsoft Word and all that. I don't even think, I don't even know if that existed. But I didn't have the, the, the software to type it out like that. So I wrote that shit with a pen. I wrote it longhand with a pen and had my girl Leia, who's a good friend of mine, she typed it up. She could. She was one of the few people who could read my bad handwriting. I have some of the worst handwriting ever. And one of my homegirls, she could read my handwriting, so she typed it out for me. But I locked myself down, wrote that book, and when I put it out, became a huge bestseller. I was building the bricks. I knew it was going to be a big book. I knew because I knew the energy and the game that I was putting in it. And then my second book and my third book, I knew I started planning my success. I knew that these books would be big. You understand? I was building the blocks of success. And then when I started doing movies, I knew that the movies would be successful. I didn't know they would be as successful. I knew it would have some success because I knew the information was good and I knew the energy I was putting in it. Once I tested to see that there was an interest for what I was going to do as far as the movies. When I started doing Hidden Colors, first we did the crowdfunding just to test how much of an interest there is for a movie like this. Once I saw there was a significant interest for a history film, I put all my energy into it. I said, this is going to be at least relatively successful. When we put it out, it was enormously successful. The Hidden Colors brand, that has become the best-selling black history documentary series ever. This is why we repeated the success. We can predict success because we are the money. We are the time and energy. I want us to understand when we want, we, when we want to make something successful, all we have to do is put the time and energy into building the success. And when you see the finished product, it looks easy, but you don't understand the bricks that went into making the stuff. When you look at a building, a finished building, you look at a building and say, oh damn, it looked, that looked easy to build that building, but to see the workers laying everything down brick by brick, that wasn't an easy task. Success is built, ladies and gentlemen. We build it. That's why we can, we can get anything we want done. Is it easy? No. Because time and energy. You have to manage your time. You have to manage your energy. 
You have to use a lot of brain power. You have to do a lot of thinking. We have brains and we have the capacity to do that. See, when I do these films, the movies look very easy. But y'all have to understand, to do these movies, it takes a year. The bricks that go into the movie. Meaning, when we do these movies, especially documentaries, every time somebody in the movie says something, we have to have an image or a video to go over it. We have to have B-roll footage to go over it. That's why when you look at my movies, there's thousands of pictures and videos on top of what people are talking about. Either we have to go get an image and we have to get the rights to the image and pay for the rights to the image, or we have to find the image and sometimes we have to go through museums and then get clearances for the images. And I'm talking about for like 10 seconds of work. For every 10 seconds, we have to go through a whole process. This is brick by brick. You, you see? See, a lot of folks don't want to put in that time and that energy. You know? But if you're willing to put in the time, if you're willing to put in the energy, you're going to get success. This is why I have no problem with it, because I know that at the end of the day, I'm putting in time and energy that a lot of other folks don't want to put in. It's a tedious process sitting up all day in the crib or in your office corresponding with your editor going over every little 10 second or 20 second increment in a film that's going to be damn near two and a half hours. That's called grinding. That's brick by brick. Family, do you have the time and energy and the wherewithal to hop on a plane and go to Haiti, which is what I did for 1804? I needed a 30 second shot. When we did 1804, I had been going back and forth to Haiti and I went to, over to the UK to interview some folks, my brother Akala. We were all over the world filming 1804. We're going back and forth and at the end of the movie, I needed an ending shot to really cap the movie off and I didn't have an ending shot. I wanted to show a shot of the Citadel, which is a big historic monument out there in Haiti. I wanted a shot of the Citadel castle. The problem was there were no images of footage of the Citadel online. Nobody just, nobody went up there and just got some real good footage of it. So I had, for 30 seconds, all I needed was 30 seconds. I had to get my camera crew, get back on a plane, fly over to Haiti, go through customs, go through the whole thing, and then go take another smaller plane to the northern part of Haiti, where that place is, drive a car, and then ride a damn horse up the mountain. Because in order to get to the Citadel, you have to ride a horse up a mountain. So we're riding a horse with a camera crew, we're doing all this stuff just to get a 30 second shot. You gotta be willing to go that far with it in order to get success. You understand? This is what success takes. This is what it means to be successful, ladies and gentlemen. I put in a lot of work. So if you see me on vacation, oh, it ain't easy. Oh, I deserve every vacation that I've been on because I am the money. Because I put in the time and energy to earn that vacation. And I've been doing my vacations for 20 years. You got There's footage of me in San Tropez back in 2003, if you look online. There's footage of me with, with my little girlfriend, whoever I was dating at the time in Rome, I've been doing this because I've been putting in that work. You gotta pay the cost to be the boss. And because I own my stuff, the success is even greater. We all have to get into this mentality of owning our property that we work hard on. See, we got this thing where we wanna work hard, but we wanna do it for other people. We work hard as hell so that other people can benefit off our hard work. No, I'm working hard as hell so that I can benefit and my people can benefit off our hard work. That's who I wanna benefit off the hard work. We are going to benefit off the hard work. That's why we've made the Hidden Color series a cottage industry within itself. 
The Hidden Color series is a cottage industry. We have revitalized black bookstores all over the world. We've revitalized that. You understand? We are the success. We have to build success. Success is built. And we have to all get on code with each other and not be afraid to build success. Because again, white people will only exploit your success. They do not share ownership. They're going to pick your brain and then run with it. And see, we have to compete, family. We got to, especially as foundational black Americans, we live in a competitive society. We're told that black folks, we got to be all kumbaya-ish. I put up a tweet earlier talking about foundation of black Americans. And let me speak specifically to, fi- to my foundation of black American family. And foundation of black American family, this is why it's ultra important and imperative that we get this museum popping because this is going to be the first museum that will emphasize foundational black American heritage. You see, foundational black Americans, we're the only ethnic group and we are a specific ethnic group. Other people let it be known that they are different ethnic groups other than us. They are quick to emphasize their ethnicity, even if they're black. Foundational black Americans, we're the only ethnic group who are told that everybody else has to share our lineage. Meaning, we're invisible. We're just a bunch of niggas who are just here. We didn't come from nowhere. We just kind of ended up here and we're just like everybody else. We're just minorities and everybody else helped build America and we're all just one big melting pot. So foundational black Americans, we're the only ethnic group who are basically told that we're invisible, that we don't really exist. Well, we're African American, so we, 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 we kind of blend in. We're, we're a minority. We're just people of color. You know, we're just out here and we're everybody else is supposed to latch on to us. So we, we can't designate our own group because that's divisive. No, foundational black Americans are a very specific ethnic group. And we have a unique history that other groups do not have. And that's okay to acknowledge that. And it's okay for us to acknowledge that and to use our group cohesion to be competitive because everybody uses our group's non-cohesion in order to exploit us. You understand? They exploit us because we've never acknowledged our cohesion. Now that we have been, we're acknowledging our cohesion, people are shaking in their boots because they have exploited us for so long and they understand once we see our power, it's a wrap. Why do you think there's so much pushback on the Hidden History Museum? There's been so much pushback on the museum because they understand we're going to start taking control of our history and telling the truth. They know we're going to start telling the truth about history, especially about hip hop. They just had some kind of resolution where they made a hip hop holiday or something like that. They done. I, I don't know. Some old symbolic gesture they done done with hip hop. But they understand we're going to start taking control of the narrative of the music, of our history, of our indigenous status. When we get this museum popping, we're going to start taking control of the narrative. And that has always been a threat, us taking control of our own narrative. Now that we've acknowledged that we are our own ethnic group and we've named ourselves, see, there's power in naming yourself. When you name yourself or name anything, that's a sign of power. And we've named ourselves and we've defined ourselves clearly as foundational black Americans and now people wanna cry foul. You understand? They want to cry foul. It's too late to cry foul because too much of too many of us are on code now. Notice we've dropped all that people of color talk. We've dropped all that minority talk. We ain't doing that. We're taking control of our narrative 
and it's very important because look, when it comes to us, black people, uh, when, when whenever they finance something that they have that we're supposed to be involved in, it's always going to be some kind of other agenda. Family, I can't even look at television shows now without a damn agenda being promoted in it. Like when I look at the show, the power shows, for example, I was, you know, we were on vacation and I just got back off vacation and we're watching the show Raising Canaan, which is an offshoot of the power shows. And even that, even all the power shows that has has a lot of black people. You watch these so-called black shows and all of a sudden the black characters are in relationships in same sex relationships with white people. They're crowbarring lesbian and gay relationships in all of these so-called black shows. If we don't control our narrative, they're going to crowbar their narrative in our narrative. That's why with the museum, they have an African-American history museum in LA. The first thing you go in there and see is LGBT stuff. We have to control our narrative. Look at the Olympics. In the Olympics, there's a sister named Allison Felix, a very decorated um, black American sister, very thorough sister. Now with some of these other athletes, they always emphasize their LGBT relationships. Some of these other black athletes, they love emphasizing if they are in LGBT relationships. There's one American athlete, this, this black woman who's actually from Ghana, but she immigrated here and she's she's competing for America. She's running around with an American flag and bucking her eyes left and right. And she's married to a white man. So they'll show her zaddy, they'll show that. She's bucking her eyes something crazy. I love it in America, I love it, I love it. She's bucking her eyes. So they show her white zaddy. But this black American sister, and I think she's FBA, our sister Allison, notice how they kept promoting Allison as a, they kept promoting her and talking about her like she was a single mother. <coughs> Every time they promote her, they talk about how she came back from the Olympics and reunited with her daughter. All of the articles kept talking about her reuniting with her daughter. Allison Felix came back and she she got back and reunited with her adorable her adorable daughter. She's back with her daughter. They kept making it seem like she was a single mother. And the reality is Allison, she has a goddamn black husband. This woman has a whole husband that they act like don't even exist. They do not want to see functional heterosexual black families. That's like kryptonite to these people. You never see that. There's never a functional heterosexual black family that they promote. They sit up and act like this woman's black husband does not exist. They sit up here talking about her and her baby as if it's just them. No, somebody said they showed her. her. They, they don't show that, sisters. In, in some of the articles, when you see articles about Allison, they keep talking about her and her daughter. They do that a lot. They do that a lot. This is why it's important for us to control the narrative. We have to compete, ladies and gentlemen. And speaking of sports, let me go off on something real quick. Speaking of sports, what's this young dude? It was a, a, a ball player, PJ. What's PJ's name? He got with this chick named Brittany Renner and had a baby by Brittany Renner. And there were rumors that he has to pay all of this crazy child support. I don't think that amount that he has to pay is true. That that sounds like all caps, sound like some shit people made up. But just the fact that this dude got low-key finessed by Brittany Renner. Now, Brittany Renner is kind of sort of known as a, as a groupie type of chick. You know, in the realm of Superhead, she wrote a book about, you know, her exploits with famous dudes. So this Brittany Renner chick, what's PJ's last name? So this woman has made videos years ago talking about how easy it is to finesse ball players. So she got this dude, PJ, was it Washington? What's his last name? PJ Washington. So she, she kind of robbed the cradle. So in, she was in her late 20s. So she got this dude when he was like 18 or 19. 
she 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 vultured on him. She she preyed on this young nigga because she knew the dudes around her age, they were already hip to her ass. She even said that, you know, she got at Kaepernick and and allegedly Colin Kaepernick had her fly herself out in order for her to to get um to get into a little tussle. She didn't even get flewed out. She had to flew herself out. She had to fly herself out. She flewed herself out in order to get at Kaepernick because cats knew. They knew she wasn't the kind of chick to, to really invest in. Some of the veterans in the game, they already knew her name was in her name was going around the block. So yeah, the 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 veterans in the game knew better. So she knew she couldn't get over on some of these veterans out here, some of these dudes her age. So she had to she had to go and get some of those first round rookie niggas fresh out of high school. She had to go get at them and that's so scandalous. And this is why we got to give game to our young dudes. This is why we got to start I got to I, I got to start some of those Mac lessons back. That's why I was doing Mac lessons so our young brothers wouldn't get caught up like that. My young dudes, y'all better realize that some of these females that you see, you get in the game, you get a you get those contracts and some of these these exotic looking chicks that you think are exotic. It's your first time getting at them because y'all come from these little small towns. Y'all dealing with some of the little average girls. And then when you get that contract, some of these exotic looking chicks start coming down there, batting their eyes at you. Family, young dudes understand those exotic Britney Renner type of chicks. They are a dime a dozen out here in L.A., in New York, in Miami. Family, they are a dime a dozen. They're all over out here. It's nothing to them. You see them on every block. Family, don't throw your well, don't throw your lot in there and throw everything away just because you got your little exotic poon. They're all over, fam. They're all over in cities like this. That's why they got to go at y'all. They got to go to the small town cats and bat their eyes at you. You understand? They praying on your family. That's why you got to get you some, some OGs to be around so they can lace you with some game. Family, don't think you special. These little exotic looking chicks come at you. They start spitting that game at you. You think you... You think you special? You know she done been around the block. Y'all know these women done been around the block. Some of these women are showing up. These old bras are showing up at these colleges on niggas. That's their whole thing. They're showing up. They know what they're doing. They know what they're doing. Look, I was 21. I look, hell, I was 19 at one point. Some of them little older broads were hollering at me when I was young. They know how to holler at young niggas and, and you know, show their little experience. They got little sexual tricks that they do. You know, they got a couple of dollars from other niggas they finessed. So they come around young niggas flashing their little old shit. And a, a, a young nigga who ain't really used to that, you get impressed. You think, oh, damn, I didn't got the big leagues. I'm getting with one of these exotic chicks. She got a couple of dollars. She's rolling nice. You know, that impresses certain young niggas. Young niggas get impressed by that. Now, I dealt with some women like that before. You know, some of their stuff was impressive. It wasn't impressive for me to start busting up in them raw, though. I knew better than to do that. I wasn't busting up in them raw. See, some of y'all niggas, y'all get some of that exotic cooch and then you start busting up in them. I don't know where you think your sperm is about to go. You niggas think they sperm is about to go to a sperm rehab or somewhere. No, nigga. Y'all get caught up in the moment and then forget about your million dollar. You got million dollar sperm, nigga. You think your sperm is about to go to a resort somewhere in Mexico. No, dumb nigga. If you sitting on millions, man, you better be very cognizant of where you busting nuts. I wasn't, when I was 19, 20, I wasn't even sitting on that kind of money, but I knew I would be. 
I knew I would be, so I was very careful about where I was bussing. I knew that my money was going to be right at one point. So I wasn't letting them finessing me. I wasn't going to let them finesse me out of the semen. <laughs> you dig? Y'all niggas get some of that exotic cooch. And then y'all don't know how to act. Y'all forget that you running up in them raw. You think you running up in them and that you some kind of special nigga to these broads, man. Get off the ego thing, man. These chicks done been around the block. These chicks fuck any nigga with a new contract. That's why you better have some Mac bones in your body. Oh, them cougars would try to get at me all the time. I would have them cougars buy me all types of shit. I wasn't impressed after a while because my game was strong. I'm 19, 20, had these older women in their 30s buying me all types of cars. The cougars love me. The cougars love me to this day. Oh, the cougars love me, even though, you know, I'm, I'm doing very well. Even old white women, white women, old white women see me rolling. Old white, old elderly white women be trying to flirt with me all the time. I ain't even talking about the, the older sisters. I, I used to get with the older sisters back in the day. But hell, when I'm out and about, nigga, when I'm when I got the drop top down, old white women, old rich white women be trying to pull up on me. They be using old school terms. Hey, good looking. What you got cooking? All right. All right. All right. <laughs> okay, Sally, go on somewhere. Hey, what's shaking, bacon? Let me using all these old school terms. Hey, buddy, you're the bee's knees. All right. Go on somewhere, Mustang Sally. I'm not going there with you. Oh, old white women always trying to pull up on me. Them old white women when I'm driving by myself with the drop top down. Oh, the old white women, they be choosing heavy. Yeah? <laughs> no, thank you. No, thank you, Miss Daisy. I'm like, go, go find driving Miss Daisy. Don't come drive with me. No, ma'am, Dolores. But like I said, man, we got to be careful out here. My young guys, when you sitting on some money, you got to be extra careful out here, man. You better be very careful about where you're putting your seeds. Understand the value of your seeds. We have to understand our value in general. Foundational black Americans, we have to understand our value. We really have to understand our value. And understand the value of our lineage and our history. This is why we want to do the museum so we can value and honor our lineage and our history. Black folks, we've always been builders. We've always been builders and creators and we have a strong lineage of building and creating. Family, black family. When you go down south and look at all of these historic plantations that were built, these were foundational black Americans not only building these plantations that are still up today, they were designing them. When I was filming Buck Breaking down in Louisiana, we filmed on a couple of plantations. They were telling us that it was black people who not only built them, they were they had a statue of a black man who was actually the architect of those plantations, those big old mansions down there. It was black folks building these things. Family, our family members designing this stuff. We need to know our history and put some respect on our history. Because see, they go out of their way to hide our history, especially our history of being aboriginal to this land. And I think there's been a lot of artifacts that have been destroyed that has proven our black indigenous history here. See, the white supremacists are very good at destroying certain things. When they find something, they'll destroy it. They'll find it, hide it, destroy it. A lot of stuff that they didn't destroy, they didn't destroy because they couldn't find it. For example, when you go down to Mexico and Central America, places like that, a lot of the monuments you see with black people, it wasn't destroyed because the white supremacists didn't find it in time to destroy it. For example, when you go to the pyramids down in Mexico, and you see the bone and pack murals of these black indigenous people with dreadlocks. If you go down to Mexico, there's tombs 
in pyramids where there are black people with dreadlocks. The reason the Spanish white supremacists and, and the other ones didn't destroy that is because all of that stuff was kind of buried in the forest and the woods and the jungles down there. So they just couldn't find it. They would find that stuff later. Even the Olmec statues. Remember, the Olmec statues, they found those fairly recent because they were buried in the ground. So they didn't destroy them because they couldn't find them in time. You understand? Yeah. Uh, in Egypt, notice how they tried to blow, they blew the noses off every damn statue they could find. They would shoot the damn noses off. They, The stuff in Egypt, it was so big, they couldn't destroy everything. Oh, they damn Napoleon and those dudes, they damn sure tried. They damn sure tried to destroy as many monuments and take them out as they could. Family, when I was in Turkey, I was just in Turkey recently. They got a big ass obelisk in the middle of Istanbul that they got from Kemet. They done took so much of our stuff out of Africa and, and put it all up in Europe. You go to France, they got obelisks in France. You go to Rome in Italy, they got obelisk in Italy. They, they got one in Central Park. Oh, they'll take your shit and destroy it and put it in a museum and act like you never existed. This is why we have to control our history. And family, we have six days for people to get involved with the Hidden History Museum. We can do it, family. We got six days to reach a million. I know we can do it. We are successful people and we have to build success. This is something that we can build from the ground up. All we have to do is just do it. We don't have to overthink it. Let's just put our paper in it. Let's do it. Let's own and control our history. Let's own and control the power move we're trying to make. This is something that we can do, especially as foundational black Americans, as powerful and as much as we have survived, we have survived the greatest atrocity in recorded history. You think we can't get a few hundred thousand dollars together for a damn museum and we've survived 400 years of the greatest atrocity and we've rebuilt and built and rebuilt cities and towns all over this country? Yeah, we can do that. Let's tap back into our ancestry and let's get busy, ladies and gentlemen, because success is our destiny. That's been today's episode of Tariq Radio. Go to hiddenhistorymuseum.com. Share the link. Let everybody know to get involved. We got six days. That's all or nothing. Either we're going to do it or we're not going to do it. We have six days. It's all or nothing. Family, we can do this. Y'all have a great night. I'll talk to you Sunday. <laughs>